and I'm very honored to be able to introduce the accident that led me to the world. With Rayanne Richards, Mark Mandeville, and Zach Cirrus. They are an all acoustic, non percussive chamber folk trio from Massachusetts. Their name is from a song written by Mark, elaborated into a concept of an allegorical narrative involving a boy who sails away to an island to be alone. They met mm, about five or six years ago, and uh, the beginning roots of forming their trio, where both Zach and Mark were hosting open mics. And Rayanne was attending both open mics and performing some with Mark. And as they continued to perform together, uh, it came up they were looking for a bass player. And Rayanne knew a host of open mic, being Zach and the trio was then formed, and they spent about a year writing and rehearsing their songs together, and then took it out on the road. They have performed locally and throughout the country, and Rayanne had noted that some of their most significant shows have been done for charity. In particular, for, she had mentioned for a local food shelter that they performed for, and they call the event Will Work for Food and they offered a free show to anyone who came that night and donated food to the shelter. When asked about the diversity of performance experiences that they've had and what, uh, what they've learned from their audiences, I was told that cities can be hard to play when you're not from around there, that people tend to be oversaturated with culture and sometimes take performance for granted. But the small towns are incredible and one of their favorite places to perform was Labyrinth Press Company in Jamestown, New York. And I was told they even held an auction to give them extra money for gas. Good idea, we'll have to work on that here. <laughs> and uh, what they also said was, the last time we were there, some of the friends we've made had said our presence in the town changes the town somehow, and after we leave, everyone feels more motivated and excited about improving their town. They have two CDs, and we have them on the back table today, and I invite you to take a look at them. When asked for one or two of the most memorable and important moments in performing, I was told that for the accident that led me to the world, when fans come running up to them after a performance and exclaim how much they enjoy what they do, and more importantly, how they really get it and understand their performance. And I was told, with conceptual art of any kind, you take a big risk, hoping that enough people will be receptive to the ideas and understand what you're doing and why it's important. When you have someone respond to the art that way, it reminds you why you like to play music and make art and inspires you to continue. So we're looking forward to having them share their special art form of music and story with us here in the small town of Hopkinton today. Please help me welcome the accident that led me to the world. We've been told by the sound engineers <laughs> that they want a little bit before. So they'll edit this out later. <laughs> And that's also why we're going to stop halfway through this song.
Thumbs up. It's <laughs> good. That's TV for okay. That's, okay. So we're the accident that led me to the world, and we're a conceptual chamber folk trio. At least that's what our, our label calls us, and it is publicly accepted as what we are. <laughs> we're playing songs off both our first and second records. And we have those with us. But for those of you at home watching this afterwards, you can go to our website, www.theaccidentthatledmetotheworld.com. Will you have that floating under us? Can, can you do I heard they do. I heard they do graphics. Okay. We get what we ask for. You could really have it where we were pointing to. That'd be great. <laughs> what are you trying to say? What are you trying to say? Is it? don't know how to love Long nights, long days It's either the same Or the bridge is falling in Down, down, down goes pieces Politics and a real beating heart. There she goes off crying. Look how what you did. Was it worth it? Was it worth it? Down, down, down goes pieces. Where my feet fell Gone, gone, gone Goes the whole mess Goes the whole mess Goes the whole mess
like a sigh or sing a song like a rhyme or a vessel like a bottle with a message.
to playing on television because we don't oftentimes get to do this. And we didn't realize there was going to be people here. We thought we were going to be in an empty studio, so this is nice what Cheryl's doing for you. I hope you appreciate it. This is another song off our, our most recent uh, recording. It's called The Island Gospel is the name of the album, and this song is called Life is an Anchor.
now listen enough to your story and I've soaked up each one of your tears and I walk miles with your boots on my feet and I
guys very much for listening. We're going to play a few more songs, and that'll be it. And then on with the show. And then on with the show. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for having us here. We really appreciate it. And now we are going to play songs off our first record. Is that right? <laughs> we'll play that song. This is actually the song called The Accident That Led Me to the World. It's what we do is based on a story, as Cheryl was explaining to you. It's a, it's a plot about a boy who leaves society thinking that solitude will be the answer. Uh, album two is him finding out solitude is neither the answer. Uh, this song is about when he was first leaving and what happened when he got to where he was going.
been the accident that led me to the world, and this is our last song. Our next feature, Fred Marchant, grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, on the working class half of what is known on the east side. As a child, he said one of his favorite pastimes was climbing the Japanese maple that grew in his backyard and that the branches were very low. And Fred said, I think now I must have liked not only climbing, but the sitting in the tree. And perhaps he might have even had some pondering of poetry at that time and didn't even know it. Fred wrote his first poem, second semester in a freshman year in college at Providence College when he was studying Dante's Inferno. And he said that something in that led him toward writing or trying to write poems. In 1970, Fred was in the Marine Corps on the island of Okinawa. And he said what began the process for him then of uh, writing um, and uh, his experience in the Marine Corps, he saw the first glimpses and reports of My Lai massacre there. And when I saw those scenes of carnage and atrocity, I recall looking up at the ceiling and declaring I was not a Nazi. And that was the beginning for me. And in 1970, Fred became one of the first officers to be honorably discharged as a conscientious objector from the U.S. Marine Corps. 
After that, Fred spent a year traveling in Europe, North Africa, Israel, and the territories. And he said at the end of the travel, he spent three months on a farm in Donegal in Ireland trying to write in prose an account of what happened at that time and how he joined and then left the Marine Corps. Fred said the prose was really not anything but a long getting it out of my system, but it did teach me what it meant to try and write daily or almost daily. And he went on to study graduate school at the University of Chicago in literature. And in the mid-1980s, Fred said that I felt the need to have a teacher of poetry. And he said, I was fortunate to be able to work with William Stafford in various summer workshops out west for three years running. We became friends, and long after his death in 1993, he has remained one of the most important influences in my writing life. Also in the mid-'80s, I first met and heard and read Seamus Heaney, who to this day also remains a major affirming presence in my writing life. Fred's first book of poetry, The Tipping Point, came out in 1994, and the winner of the 1993 Washington Prize in Poetry he received. He had a number of his other collections of poetry published, and a number of them are on the back table today. Fred began teaching in the Writers' Conference offered by William Joyner Center for the Study of War and Social Consequences at UMass in Boston. And he said it was through the Joyner Center and its early exchanges with present-day Vietnam that I met the poet Chung Dang Quai and in general was introduced to Vietnamese culture, not by war, but by poetry. His second book of poems, Full Moon Boat, came out from Grey Wolf Press in 2000. And House on Water, House in Air, and New and Selected Poems came out in 2002. He's also the co-translator with Nguyen Ba Chum of From a Corner of My Yard, poetry by the Vietnamese poet Chung Dang Quai. And this book was published in 2006 by the Education Publishing House and the Ho Chi Minh Museum in Hanoi, Vietnam. Fred shared um, a quote from poet Octavio Paz about the importance of why we share poetry in the written form and orally. And he said in his quote of Octavio, it is the nature of art, even the most inward looking art, to want to engage the world in that sense of completing itself in the imagination of another human being. It is in the nature of a poem to want to exist in and among others. And when asked, why is it important for you to write poetry, Fred said, how else would I know or be who I am? We look forward to hearing Fred's words. Please help me welcome at this time, Fred Marchant. I'm going to read mostly from um, my most recent book of poetry, which came out only last week. So that's... Um, but I'm going to do a little bit of, just a little bit of um, opening things. I'm going to read a little bit from Full Moon Boat. I'm going to read from the title poem of it. And that, that is um, a poem. It's a sequence, actually, a sequence of short lyrics um, that all reflect what Cheryl said just at the end of her introduction, that um, my first encounter with Vietnam in real life, in real time, was through its culture and not through the war that our country waged there. And, and so I, when I first went to Vietnam, the first thing that, um, that happened was that I was, I was stunned into um, awareness of the rich brocade of history and its cultural life. And, um, and actually, this, this too had its own way of looking at the war, too, funnily enough. There are lots of ways to illustrate this, but the, the epigraph from this poem, uh, from Mumboat, is, is a good way to do it. It's, it's from a poem by Ho Chi Minh that he wrote in 19, he, was, he would write New Year's greetings. It's a tradition to write a New Year's greeting poem. And he would write a short poem. Uh, and this was, I think, in 1948. Um, and it was a guerrilla war against the return of the French colonialists that he was involved in. And, and I, I'm going to paraphrase the four lines of the poem pretty badly, but the last line is a, is a translation. He says, you know, you can gather on the river and you can, you know, get all the arms and stuff ready, but that's not quite the point. And this is the last line of the poem. Yes, he says, sell the compass. Come on the boat of the full moon. 
And I always thought, you know, what does that mean? <laughs> what does it mean to let go of the compass? Uh, I think it had something to do with the poverty of the, their effort. You know, they weren't rich with weapons or technology. But also a greater trust, I think, in some, what they understood, those, uh, those Vietnamese, that they, you know, that the river was on their side, you know? Well, as it turns out, they were right in that sense. But I'm going to read now um, uh, from Full Moon Boat, the poem. It's part of one. There are four parts to it. I'll just read the first and the fourth. Ensemble. When the drumhead's skin is tightened just enough and the zither with inlaid pearl discovers the key, when the vibrato spool of the denbao and the strings of the moon lute find themselves. When stick castanets and finger teacups begin to shiver and singers in carmine silk begin their courting. When a warm steady rain starts to sweep over tiaras and the back and forth lean of planting, then the northern lands will learn the river music and begin to flower. So I'm going to jump to the end where there's a river, there's another river. Um, it's this part four is called the Kintai Ferry, and it's, uh, it's set by a village where the poet that Cheryl mentioned, Tan Ling Kwa, who I was privileged to tra co-translate work, and he's a friend, where he grew up. He grew up as a child prodigy of a poet uh, during the years of the American War. His first poem was published when he was 12 or so. And um, he became quite famous, actually, as a sign of the enduring spirit of Vietnamese art, culture, life that would not be bombed into submission. Uh, in fact, the village that he lived in or grew up in was right next to a, a, a crossing, a river crossing, that was used daily by the troops going to the south, to the war zone in the south. And uh, uh, it was bombed regularly, daily, by the uh, B-52s. So the whole area around his village was pockmarked with B-52 craters. And, um, and I'm sure they're still there. When I first visited, you could see they were, they were all being used for um, uh, um, um, fish culture, you know, growing fish for food and, um, and, um, and for lilies, for water lilies and that sort of thing. Oh, lotuses, sorry. The Kintai, in the river, at that point, it's, the, it's one of the Red River tributaries, and it's called the Kintai. The Kintai Ferry. We think they are crossing. Here, where bombs fell under the cries of the stork, where dike walls are alive with winter grasses, we think they are crossing again. On the slope where the pavement ends and willows are thin arms in the wind, a woman squats by her bicycle, a rice bale strapped to its rack, too heavy to push. We think they are crossing here, just beyond the lotus growing in the bomb crater ponds, just beyond the fairy's dented bow, our arms pushing with her now. Well, it is, and it is really an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? A sad and interesting phenomenon that, that we're not alone, I think, in this. But Americans have always found their geographical and cultural consciousness being expanded by war. I mean, isn't it true? And, it's, and it occurred to me more than once uh, yesterday, right? And, uh, and what I'm referring to, of course, is Obama's speech in Cairo, the day before yesterday, and then the reports yesterday, of Obama's speech in Cairo and so forth. And then yesterday, uh, his visit to Buchenwald, what a great sort of, you know, grasp of um, cultural and historical complexity of suffering. In any case, uh, I'm, I'm a lapsed Catholic. I'll say more about that in a minute. But I, I, mean, I grew up a Catholic. I, you know, I have great sort of love of religious you know, thought and expression, but I'm not a practitioner of anything. However, I, I do have a, you know, some aesthetic sense of, of those practices. And I spent some time in Jerusalem, actually, over uh, de November and December. And for those of you who know the city, there are, there are two deep valleys you know, leading southward. And they, they are in East Jerusalem. And so when the Muslim calls to prayer occur, they work their way up the valley. 
And so I thought, I thought this morning, actually, that we were getting up early. I thought I'd begin with a call to prayer, you know, and it is a call to prayer. So this is a, this is a secular sense, a call to prayer. The sound begins somewhere in the south in what one imagines as the desert, but is really nothing empty. Though for a second or two the air hints at the endless and the dark we have all risen from. It is a sound that passes in a relay of voice to voice and says, Here, this is yours, and here, Take this to the next. And so like waves that gain on one another and thus grow more numerous, the prayer climbs the valley before the golden walls of reason and enters even the dark, narrow byways piled high with bitterness where the hands push a green metal shutter aside and the eye of morning opens wide but is still dreaming. <clears throat> As Cheryl said, I did grow up in Providence. Um, and um, like any city, but so much like the north, northeastern cities of the Industrial Revolution. Sorry for the moving away. Um, uh, it has a kind of, you know, really visible geographical class structure. And, it really, and so when, 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 when Cheryl said the working class side of the east side, if anyone knows Providence, there is the other half of the east side. You know, it really is brown and, you know, and, and the old money of the, of the New England um, slavers and whalers, you know. And uh, um, so this, this little poem is from, uh, from the Looking House, and it... And it is from uh, the east side of Providence, coming straight from the east, east side to you. Camp and locust, it's the corner. Camp and locust, house on the corner where I grew up. Second floor flat I still find in dreams. Window from which I see candy squirm out of his collar again. It is always a lurid purple night, the middle of summer. He is taking off, having figured it out, and is headed toward all that existence promises, even to dogs. Thank you. <laughs> and Candy thanks you. This is, a, this is a visit to Emily Dickinson's house in, um, in western Massachusetts, in Amherst. The poem is called Nobody Too. I would be small and innocuous, as harmless as the wind that lifts the grass lightly and bends the lupins, the new stems barely green. I would pause in affirmation like the squirrels in the pine, my back arching and torso rippling into a question that flees before the answer. I would teach my heart how to be a heart, help the doors open wide, invite the tall shadows to peek in like curious strangers, the chambers brimming over with them I don't expect everybody to know automatically what the drum room is, but the, in, in prisons, in the entrances to visiting a prison, there's always some kind of room in which uh, you have to pass through after you've been you know, scanned and all of that. You still have to pass through a room in which you're sealed before you're let into the prison and vice versa going out. And it's one last look by a guard to make sure that you know, 
you know, not carrying contraband or whatever. Um, but uh, at Norfolk, you know, Norfolk Prison down in um, the south of Boston, uh, it's a really one of those great, uh, God, how can I say it? You know, and it's not a great one. It's a dungeon, and it's a great stone building, and it's really that sort of 19th century granite brutality. And, but it has the most extraordinary drum room. It, it's about 30 feet tall. And before you got into the courtyard, you passed through it. And it, you really do have that medieval sense from it. In any case, I was teaching a class, and one passed through the drum room. The drum room. <clears throat> the door you, excuse me, the door you come through slams shut before the door you go to opens. A last stopping place a once-over from the guard behind his tinted glass. Your pockets are empty, wristwatch in the locker with wallet and change, two pens, a notebook, a wish to act normal and show you threaten no one. It's completely true. You threaten no one. Nonetheless, you feel either you are in danger or that you are the danger. It is a retort designed not to contain, but open and shut like a valve. A space between entrance and egress, pressure and release. A moment of pure supplication. A revelation of true marrow and meaning. Hiatus, opening, rupture, fissure, gap. A room close to nothing, the reinforced shell of its nothing. Who here cannot help but think of a plump fly bumping against a window? A fly who believes something will give. Something does. A buzzer, then juice through the wire, and the latches slide in, slide out. So you can see, I, I designed my sequence here to get, to go, oh, I suppose, deeper into that. What was that phrase from the song? The, a sort of hole of misery, really. So we're heading deeper now, okay? Um, it is Saturday morning, so we really have a lot of sort of sustenance ahead of us, you know, and so there's, you know, energy is high, and um, durability is ours. The Black Dog, and there's a, an epigraph from a great Australian poet, Les Murray, a poem called Quiniche. He says, Les Murray says, Adrenaline howling in my head, the black dog was my brain. The Black Dog. Beware the red taxi bleeding like a fresh wound, and walkers who know what waits for them. Beware stern yellow flames, the destiny that blisters all, and little signs hung from lamp poles like fascists. Beware the bulbs formed into the outline of a man crossing the street. Beware his elbows, his feet, and his soul. Beware anyone who tells you the signs are right or that he is guiltless. Beware the black dog at your feet. He thinks you are in trouble and wants to help. He thinks you are going to kick him or break his neck. He thinks you are the trouble, so he bears his teeth. He raises his lips to show you how much he cares, how much he loves your life and would do anything to save you. Beware him, because he will devour you. Beware the wordless sounds he makes. Beware his ghostly body, especially when it looks like me. It is said in the annals that if you see him, you must kill him or tell someone else about him. If you fail to do this, you will die and great harm will come to all of your family. This is, um, this is a slightly longer poem. 
It's in three parts. It's called The Custody of the Eyes. And the title, uh, the, that title comes from a religious practice in Roman Catholicism, Christianity in general, but in the, in the orders. And it has to do with um, the spiritual discipline of not letting your eyes roam, you know, improperly or even at all, you know, just to sort of keep a still point focus of attention. And um, so it's a kind of triptych, you know, that kind of altarpiece sense of three units. It's a triptych, and it's, it's in pretty big, um, different forms each time and different places and different times, too, uh, alterations that way. So it's a kind of large, uh, large collage. And it begins with a sculpture that was really a collage, uh, a sculpture that I remember seeing first um, at the William Joyner Center that Cheryl referenced, the William Joyner Center for the Study of War and Social Consequences has a two weeks writer's workshop. And there's also a really beautiful gallery down there at UMass Boston, the Harvard Gallery. And one of the participants in the workshop, a woman named Lynn Doran, who now lives in New Zealand, was really, she was a sculptress is what she was doing. And, and she had stuff up. And so she took the writing workshop too, just for fun. And um, and this, so the opening section of this is really a response to um, to an installation that she kind of two very uh, sort of bas relief kind of installation on the wall, large wall size installation. So I called it a sculpture, but you know now you know, the custody of the eyes one, <clears throat> on a sculpture by Lynn Doran. The eyes are green jewels cut from bottle glass. The skin blushes with rouge as much as plastic allows. Her hair is hell, blonde hell about to flame. Had you the desire, you could rip it from its visible sockets. She wears a demurely laced collar and a demi-choker made of pearls. At center chest, a catacomb to enshrine her heart, inside of which a kapok hand, palm, turned out. Beneath her waist, a swirl of plaster molding standing in for pubic hair, but all outside her dress and thereby domestic as an apron. An antique photograph of five women sits upon her belly. It is a bronze female family gazing through a temporal aperture, ready to become, as the mother surely knew, someday nothing more than this. A plain white dress splays against the wall as backing and frame. Chandelier spikes to hem, a hint of promenade and a ball. There are no legs for dancing and nothing else beneath, as there never was a person here. Just the parts topped with cupid lips and a stunned green stare. Two. The origins of the practice. In some orders, the eyes are trained to look neither left nor right. As one walks, excuse me, I'll do that line again. It's, these are new. In, in some orders, the eyes are trained to look neither left nor right as one walks, but to focus instead on two or three steps ahead. Cloister manuals might ask one to avoid looking up as a person enters the room, so as to keep the still point focus of attention. One could, I suppose, keep any of the senses in custody, but eyes are naturally unruly, straying without conscience. Recall the infant's peekaboo, the thrill of presence and absence, or the would-be lover's stolen glance, or the aggression in sizing someone up, or the contempt one senses in an unrelenting stare. And then... There is Agnes, about whom little is certain except the importance of eyes in her story. Twelve-year-old daughter of Roman aristocrats who may themselves have been converts, she becomes a Christian during the reign of Diocletian and his persecutions. A prefect's son who is smitten by her and possibly her wealth proposes marriage 
but she refuses, saying she has already consecrated her virginity to a spouse who cannot be beheld by mortal eyes. Her conversion is brought to the attention of a judge who invites her to return to the pagan and burn incense at the shrine of Minerva. When she refuses, he threatens her with torture. Fires are lit, hooks and spikes assembled, but these do not frighten her. The judge orders her stripped before a crowd in the square, thinking humiliation will work. But a miracle of visual custody occurs. The crowd, especially the young men, avert their eyes. All but one lad, curious and impudent, with lust taking hold. Instantly, he is struck by lightning and blinded. The blow leaves him convulsing in the square. The lesson, however, does not end with him. The judge will have to order Agnes executed. Here the accounts vary widely. She is burned alive or beheaded or given the gentle death, a slit artery in the neck. Perhaps it takes time for the authorities to decide on a method. As their betters discuss what to do, the ordinary soldiers pause to look things over. They speak of the child's long hair that during the day had lengthened into a veil to cover her body. They marvel at the shackles that keep falling off her tiny wrists. They puzzle over the fires that won't stay lit. And like soldiers everywhere, they stand and stare at what they would have to do, but did not want to do, and would do anyway. The reverie lasts long enough to make the child herself grow impatient with them. Agnes calls out toward one who has his sword already drawn. This lover, she shouts, this one at last, I confess it, pleases me. I shall welcome the whole length of his blade into my bosom. What are you waiting for, executioner? What are you waiting for? Three. <clears throat> The Day Room. The elevator to my sister's end of the ward is still broken. The back stairs make me feel as if I'm doing something forbidden, though I am not. As I climb the three floors, I fear a patient is going to jump me. The wards have men mixed in. It must be a childhood fear what the crazy people will do to you if they catch you. Even now my legs feel heavy with it. We are bringing Pat a Christmas sweater. We also have a small tin crucifix that came for free in the mail. When we give it to her, she looks at it as if we had saved her soul, a kind of joy that I am sure I have not ever felt. Still, it almost redeems this afternoon that has so little light. When I wheel her down to the day room, the nurse says Pat speaks of me all the time. All the nurses say how much we look alike, and I say it is our mother, and Pat says our mother was in to see her last night. I am glad to hear this. No need to say to anyone the decades our mother has been dead. Green jimmies on the cupcake out on the tray. Balloons floating, bumping ever so lightly at the ceiling. At 20 minutes, we are out of things to talk about. TV is on, a channel of endless caroling. Pat loves to sing, sings at the drop of a hat. She knows all the words. Easier for her to sing than to speak. All the other patients in the day room by now, most wheeled in from the corridor. Some are tethered to their chairs, leaning their eyes rigid and wide. I am at a loss for a name for that look. I touch my sister's soft gray hair and I kiss her on the brow. Lunchtime now, 
But I say, we'll be back soon. My eyes are lowered and I feel nothing but shame at the lie in soon. I imagine everyone sees right through me. Thank you. Thank you. Is that a sign I should stop? No. Okay. okay. I, 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 uh, I actually was, I was reading the poem, that poem, and I was thinking of reading it at the end, and I thought, oh, no, I could never end on that ending. You know? <laughs> Terrible. But thank you. That was so nice. And I won't stop. Uh, 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 okay. Good. I was just actually looking for a signal through the, through the back. Actually, I'm going to read two uh, very short poems, but they're both, you'll see why. They're really, they're ones from William Stafford, ones from, um, from The Looking House. And um, I, edited, I edited this uh, collection, this selection of, his early, of Stafford's early poems. These were poems written between 1937 and 1947 and center on his years during World War II when he was a conscientious objector. And, you know, I'm not really trying to make a sort of D-Day point here, by the way. You know, I think that there's a wide variety of human experience to be understood uh, in this regard. But certainly this was one of the sort of underground streams of American life and heart uh, during World War II. You know, the civilian public service program he was a part of was in the draft law. And he spent the four years of the war from January, um, yeah, from January 1942 to January 1946 uh, in the civilian public service work camps. It's also when he got started as a poet. And uh, so these, these poems have a kind of strange double life. They are about what it meant to be in kind of internal exile, as they all sort of seem to use that metaphor. And at the same time, something also about, about um, their community of exile and the art and thought and so forth that held them together. So um, my favorite poem in the entire book is a poem called Shall We Have That Singing? And it was written on January, January 19th, 1944 in the Los Prietos a work camp in, near Santa Barbara in the Santa Inez Mountains over Santa Barbara. And it's by William Stafford and, um, well, I actually, a camp that looked like that. That's what I, I'll get you for the camera. It's on, there's a photograph on the cover of the book that he, it's his photograph of one of the camps he was in. Shall we have that singing? Shall we have that singing in the evening? For between the stars and our star, there is no one, and we must sleep again. We rest the hands not dangerous on the wool, and we place pillows under the turning head. Quietly now, no moving, was there something forgotten? The losing one neglects and calls it winning? Help each other. Have that singing in the evening. I'm going to end on um, the last poem in the Looking House. It's called First Song Again. First Song Again. Trust all the wood you stand on. Become an ally of the grain. Bend in the wind. Trust even the high, precarious places, the steeples and windy overhangs that teach you everything. Trust, too, the rose tint of late afternoon sifting down through a lofted blue heron wing. Trust, above all, the imminent return of the small but persistent impulse to sing. This poem, um, while on a uh, church uh, youth group trip to New Orleans in April of 2008, we um, went um, to see a low-income housing project and uh, an elementary school. 
that had not been gutted out or cleaned up at all two and a half years after Hurricane Katrina. So it prompted me to write this poem, and it's called Apocalypse. Empty chairs and empty houses, quarantined by the letters TFW. Pictures of an old life, where are they now? Debris is the new grass. How can there be no more tears when the doors themselves read game over and spell death? Books lie scattered on the ground. The wind is high, yet they don't rustle, oppressed by silence and water. Empty chairs stretching as far as Lake Pontchartrain, drowning in the silence. Lunch trays scattered. Who ate off the red one? Faith, Kedrick, Joseph, Kelsey. Their classrooms now disheveled, their library marked by vandals, their violas broken and forgotten. In a modern day Pompeii, where are these children now? Thank you. This is an open letter to a songwriter. I suppose it works for poets too. heart in many pieces like serving loaves and fishes with a prayer and we receive them like from Jesus I confess I take my share Now you ask what's left for living After you have sung your heart away For when it's gone, it can't be given But with your heart, it's not that way By the giving you heal like the morning you heal by the singing of your song. songs are just illusion that they are just the high before the fall those are the words of your confusion you say you're lost aren't we all we hide our hearts under a mantle Then curse the darkness that we find we're in. But your singing lights a candle where the dark had been. You heal by the gift. Like the morning, you heal by the singing of your song. You have your voice. 
You have no choice but use it loud and strong to heal by the giving to heal like the morning to heal by the singing of your song We had a poem earlier today called Spring. This one is looking ahead a couple of weeks. Summer solstice. Clouds, high white, with cheeks of gray beckoning. Leaves low green teasing. Early promise now set fair. Let me mark your card, O mistress sun. Come join us in this dance of summer. See pollen and sneeze, a merry couple jig away the hours in perfect step. Cotton frock sounds of virgin birdsong fill the air, amidst the playful flight of adolescent feathers. Tepid water lies lazy, mired in sound of frog and cricket. Reach with open mind and heart to share in nature's gift. Playthings all, enjoy this moment. Do not look expectantly, for future winter climes as yet unknown await. Focus now on chlorophyll delight. These precious moments are but all we have. I'm sure in the recent economic climate we've all experienced friends and family who are having trouble with jobs. This is called the job fair in Providence. The clock moved closer to 11 a.m. Opening time. No hostelry or department store, but the job fair. What opportunities, what desperation. We lined up, anxious to sign in, shuffling forward, clutching our freshly printed resumes. Polished wood and hotel mirrors reflected the out-of-work faces done up in their best dark suits and ties. Imagined jobs in high tech and management filled the minds of the eager job seeker. Then, reality set in as the doors opened. He strode in proud to share his knowledge, wanting to connect, wanting to make an impression. But his crisp suit wilted at the sight before him. Hourly paid security guards, pharmacy counter clerks, bank tellers, and the army. Is this all I'm worth, he thought, 30 years of hard work swept under the worn rug of the bottom line. The magic carpet of hope and expectation has flown east. How can you tell your wife? How can you tell yourself that one more chance to get back onto the corporate path has gone? What did he do wrong? How many others line up at job fairs across the land, hoping that on this day their luck will change? Someone, anyone, will want them again to ply their craft and use their skill. As he drove home, he wondered about his own bottom line. How close was he to that place when all was lost, and he wished he could sleep forever? No more bills, no more ills. This American dream had turned into a nightmare. Thank you. Take two, ready? This song's called The Midnight Sun.
you. Thank you, Cheryl. And I would just also like to add that in addition to our open mics, we had Victoria Bosch Murray this season, and David Surrett, and Sarah Borello, and Afa Michael Weaver, and Anna Ader Mulhane, Diane Billiak, John Hodgen, Gertrude Halstead, John Swenson, John Gerard, Dan Cloutier, Adam Stone, Carla Schwartz, Libby Frank, Camille Breeze. Katie Frasinelli, Michael Frasinelli, Tom Driscoll, Denise Driscoll, Dave McPherson, Sam Bayer, Tricia Knudsen, Jane Fallon, Richard Hoffman, Suzanne Owens, Fred, um, Reggie Gibson, Rick McIntyre, Jason Miles Goss, Laura Gold, and today, Fred Marchant and the accident that led me to the world and all of it wonderful. I'm so grateful for the entire of it. Thank you all so very much. Thank you for Fred today for our feature also. Once again. Thank you.